2 Peter chapter 1, the verse that I want to start in is there in verse number 21 where the Bible reads, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And tonight's sermon is called, Where Did We Get the Bible? Where did this book, the Bible, come from? How did it make its way unto us? We all have it. Uh, hopefully in our lap right now or in our hand as we hear preaching. And we believe that it's the most important book in the world. And not only that, but it is our final authority Amen. for all matters of faith and practice. We believe it's the word of God, that it's without error. Amen. But how did this book get to us today? Now, go if you would to Hebrews chapter 1, just a few pages from where you are there in 2 Peter. Just flip a few pages to the left and you'll find the book of Hebrews. And look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Because we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of time. Adam and Eve, and then of course later we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These early Bible characters. Now they didn't walk around with a Bible in their hand like we do. They didn't have Genesis through Revelation to read from. They were actually living out the stories that would later be written in the Bible. So the question is, did they have God's word? And of course, the answer is yes, because God has always revealed his word unto mankind from the beginning of time. God's word is not new, and there's never been a time on this earth when God's word wasn't there in some form. Now look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible reads, God, who at sundry times... And in diverse manners, diverse means various manners. He, he spoke in multiple different ways, the Bible is saying. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, this is being written unto the Hebrews. This is called the epistle to the Hebrews. So the Bible here is saying to the Hebrews that God spake to their fathers or their ancestors in time past by the prophets. God used prophets that would speak the word of God unto their ancestors. And now in these last days, he's saying in the New Testament, God has spoken unto us by his son. And in the next few chapters, he goes on to explain how uh, Jesus Christ is, is greater than any other prophet. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the angels. He was actually God in the flesh, and he's the creator, and on and on. That is all found in the first three chapters of the book of Hebrews. But the point I want to make here is that before God's word was a written word that was in a book called the Bible, it was spoken by men of God. It was spoken by prophets in time past. Now, if you would, flip back to the book of Exodus, chapter 24. And while you're turning there, let me just go into that a little further. As you read the Old Testament, you will often see all throughout the Old Testament, whether you're reading in the books of Moses or whether you're reading in the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, whether you're reading in the books of 1st, 2nd Kings, you know, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, just all throughout the Old Testament, one thing that you will consistently see is men of God speaking the word of God through inspiration of the Holy Ghost where the Spirit of the Lord will come upon a prophet and he will speak God's word, he will preach God's word. And many of these prophets are not really prophets that we would know of by name because they don't have famous names. Some of them, God doesn't even give us our name. They'll just say, you know, a man of God came and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and here's what he spoke. And then other times it'll be a prophet that you've never heard of, like Oded the prophet. You know, Oded is not one that's up there with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel in our minds. But this was nonetheless a prophet of the Lord that God sent to speak his word. Nathan the prophet was one. And even Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, the brother of Cain, is referred to by Jesus as a prophet who spoke God's word. We don't see his prophecies recorded. We don't see any of his preaching. But nonetheless, we know he was a prophet. We know that Enoch was a prophet. So God used men to speak his word verbally from the beginning of time, from the days of Abel, Enoch, Noah, people before the flood. It has always been on this earth 
and it was a verbal word before it was a written word. So when did it begin to be written down? Well, the first books of the Bible that are actually written down are the first five books in your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these books are known as the Law of Moses or the Books of Moses. And they come to us at the time of Moses. So just to quickly get your mind, you know, in the right time frame, I'll just briefly explain to you uh, how we get to the time of Moses. Of course, we have the time leading up to the flood. There's a flood in the days of Noah. And then after the flood, God divides man into nations. And he chooses one man that would found a special nation that would be a pattern nation that would show the light of God's word unto the Gentiles. And of course, that man is Abraham. And through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob comes the nation of Israel. And then Israel is in Egypt in captivity for 400 years. And then Moses is the one who comes and leads them out of captivity. And most people know that story. Well, at that point is when we start having the word of God in written form in a book where this is the law of God. This is the Bible, okay? Here it is written down. Now, this comes in the time of Moses. Now, look if you would at Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. The Bible says, And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. Now flip over if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And what I want to point out about that verse we just read in Exodus 24 is this is when they first come out of Egypt. When they first come out of the land of Egypt, they've only been with Moses for a matter of months. Okay, Moses has been at Mount Sinai. In chapter 20, he gets the Ten Commandments. And then there are other commandments and statutes that God gives. And what I want to point out there is that they're immediately being written down. Even before they wander in the wilderness for 40 years, these things are already being written in a book right away in the time of Moses. And then Moses is taking that book and reading it to the people from the book that has been written down at the mouth of God, where God speaks the word and Moses writes it down and he reads it to the people and they say, all that the Lord has said, we're going to do it. We're going to obey that book, Moses. So it was written down immediately, okay? Here's another reference to it being written in a book. Deuteronomy 17 talks about a future king that they may have someday. He says, if you ever have a king, this is what that king should be like. And it says in Deuteronomy 17, 18, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. So we see God's intent that this be a written word of God where there's going to be a book that the Levites have in possession and the Levites are going to teach and preach that book to the people and then the king that will later come, he's supposed to get that book from the Levites and make a copy of it. And then that's his own personal copy, his own handwritten copy and he's supposed to read that book all the days of his life. So we see here that this is when it becomes a written word, a book, the book of the law. And what books are we talking about? Well, he said that this law, meaning Deuteronomy itself, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is what we're talking about. Now flip over, if you would, to Joshua chapter 1. Now what some people struggle with is they say, well, if Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are the books of Moses and they're, the, and they're written by Moses, then the question that they ask is, well, how come he dies in the last few verses you know, of Deuteronomy? If he's the one who wrote it, then how can he die you know, in the story at the very end? And if you would, since I'm having you go to uh, Joshua anyway, you might as well just back up a little bit into chapter 34 and just see the death here in verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 34. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab. And on and on it explains that. And then it says in verse number 8, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So 
basically because he dies at the very end, then that makes them struggle with the authorship of Deuteronomy. Now, I'm going to come back to that and explain that in a moment, okay? But for now, just look at Joshua chapter 1. So we come right off of the death of Moses in Deuteronomy 34. Look at Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Jump down to verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So, do we see here clearly that Joshua has a copy of this book? So, scholars today, and I'm going to debunk some of the claims of these liberal scholars, or, or just even unbelieving scholars, who consider themselves a Bible expert, even though they're not even saved. Even though the Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Yet these people claim to be experts in theology and then they'll openly say, well, I don't believe the Bible's God's word. You see, if you go to the Ivy League schools of this nation, Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, they'll have departments of theology where students will go and study the Bible. But it's from an unbelieving, Christ-rejecting standpoint. It's from a standpoint that it's a book of myths and fables and that it is not really the Word of God. And these experts profess themselves to be very wise about these things, but they are blinded by their unbelief. Right. And the Bible teaches us that the unbelieving man cannot understand the Bible. Right. The veil is over their eyes, the Bible says, when they read it. And when God talked about unsaved Bible teachers in Christ's day, He called them they were the blind leading the blind. And they would both fall in the ditch, He said. But they will try to say, well, the books of Moses were written much later. You know, the books of Moses are written, you know, way later in the days of like, you know, King David or King Solomon. You know, that's when the books of Moses are written. Or others will say this, well, Genesis through Numbers were written at the time of Moses, but Deuteronomy is written hundreds of years later. But I'm going to prove to you that that's not what the Bible teaches here. And I'm going to show you that that can even be proven to be inaccurate and false. Because if you look here at this scripture, it's clear that Joshua already has the complete book of the law from Moses. And he's supposed to read it and meditate in it and hearken to it. And it's already in book form. It's already a written word. That's repeatedly emphasized, isn't it? Now, if you would, go to Joshua chapter 8. Let's continue our study here of where we got the Bible that we have today. Look at Joshua chapter 8, verse 30. The Bible says, Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man had lift up any iron, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. So this book is getting copied and copied and copied already. And at this point, he actually carves it into stone. And he does it in front of all the children of Israel. He has this thing copied right then and there. The whole thing's already done. It wasn't written hundreds of years later. Then, if you would, jump to uh, chapter 23 of Joshua. Chapter number 23, verse 6. And the Bible says in Joshua 23, verse 6, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. Now flip one page over to chapter 24, verse 26. This is a key point here in, in chapter 24. Watch this carefully. Chapter 24, verse 26. And Joshua wrote these words 
in the book of the law of God. Now, these are new words. In chapter 24, he, he's preaching to the people and he's admonishing to them, you know, that they need to serve the Lord and not serve other gods. And he makes the famous statement, you know, choose who, you this day whom you'll serve. And he gives that big speech that culminates with, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And he makes a covenant with the people right there that they're going to be the Lord's people. And right after that, it says here in verse 26, and Joshua wrote these words, meaning the words we just read, all those famous statements and as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, all that. He wrote these words in the book of the law of God. So notice the words of the book of Joshua are appended to that which has already been written in the days of Moses, and it is tagged on. We got the book of the law of God. We got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now we're going to write these words into the book of the law of God. Does everybody see that? And took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye de deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sirah, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gaash. Now notice, who did the Bible say wrote those words in the book of law? Joshua did. So according to the Bible, who wrote the book of Joshua? Joshua did. Joshua wrote all these words into the book of the law of God. Okay, forming the sixth book of the Bible now, Joshua. But then notice at the very end, we have Joshua dying in the book, just like we had Moses dying in the book of Deuteronomy. Why is that? Because the Bible has just a little epilogue added at the end of the book saying, okay, Joshua wrote all this, all right? Then he died, and this is where he's buried. Someone else added that at the end. Now, probably the guy who added the end of Deuteronomy is probably Joshua, since he's the one who's adding the rest of the book of Joshua. He wants the narrative to be complete. So, obviously, Moses didn't write the part about him dying, but he wrote everything else, just like Joshua wrote everything else except the very end about him dying. Well, who wrote that last part of Joshua? I need to know who wrote. It doesn't matter. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. We don't know the names of every author, but we know that Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Bible's very clear about that. Jesus quotes it as the law of Moses all throughout the Old Testament. It's constantly being referred to as books being written by Moses, given to us by Moses. Only the very end is written by someone else, probably Joshua, as he adds in the content of the book of Joshua. And then when we get to the end of the book of Joshua, we see Joshua dies. Then we get into the book of Judges. And the book of Judges basically picks up where Joshua left off but it also recaps things from Joshua. So Judges kind of overlaps with Joshua. It's written by an unknown author. We don't know who wrote it, but we know that they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We know that it was God who used that person to pin it down. Now, here's where I want to stop and point out where the worldly scholars get it wrong and how their lack of faith in the Lord makes them unqualified to teach the Bible. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how many degrees they have. I don't care how many archaeological digs they visited. One who is filled with the Spirit of God understands the Bible better, period. One who is a doer of the Word will understand the Word. One who loves the Bible will always understand and know the Bible better than the so-called experts. These experts, they pour over these books with a fine-tooth comb trying to figure out when they were written. But they're constantly saying that they're written way later than when they claim to be written, okay? The book of Deuteronomy, the book of Genesis were, are clearly claiming to have been written and done before Joshua enters the Promised Land. Done. 
The book of Joshua is claiming to be written by Joshua, not someone hundreds and hundreds of years later. But if you look at what the scholars tell us, they'll tell us, well, you know, we think the books of Joshua and Judges are from around 586 B.C. They say it's from after Jerusalem is destroyed by the Babylonians. Okay, so they're basically saying that this book is written centuries and centuries and centuries later. I mean, think about how much happens between Joshua and the Babylonian captivity. We're talking about the 400 years that they're under the judges, Saul, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, you know, Abijah, just all the kings and just centuries and, and centuries. Literally, we're talking about that they're claiming that it's written like about a thousand years later than what it says it was written. Now, what are they basing this evidence on? How do they know that it was written later? Now, here's the thing. You can always prove that something is written earlier if you found an earlier copy. But how do you prove that it was written later when, it, when none of it is in existence anymore? Now, just to, just to explain to you about how little we know of of ancient history except for what we read in the Bible. Just to explain to you how, how documents and, and papers, they, they don't always last. When the King James Bible was translated, the oldest manuscript of the Old Testament scriptures was from A.D. 1000. Okay, stop and think about it. A.D. 1000. Meaning that you know, it's not like we just have all these, you know, copies of the biblical books from back when they were written because they've turned to dust a long time ago. And even great historical works of, of Roman historians in the first century A.D. that were even, you know, major works of literature. I remember pulling them out as a kid at the library and reading. And then all of a sudden there's just missing chapters saying, well, these are just missing because the manuscripts haven't been preserved. And we're talking about major works of literature that you'd expect. Well, th if this was such a major work, wouldn't some copy of it be around? But no, they're not. Now, the Bible has been preserved, praise God. Amen. And the reason why, and I want to make this real clear point, the reason you, you say, well, wait a minute, though. There's no Old Testament manuscript at that time that dated before A.D. 1000? How can that be? Here's why. Because the common practice back before the days of the printing press and machines and things, the common practice was that when you made it, when you had a book, right, that which you wrote upon, whether it's, you know, paper or parchment or papyrus or whatever, it was very expensive and hard to come by. It wasn't like everybody was just buying reams of paper at Staples back then and just, you know, just ballpoint pens and typewriters and just cranking this stuff out. The stuff was expensive. So, what would happen is when books and documents and parchments would get old, then what they would do is they would copy it onto a fresh sheet and then they would wash the old one and reuse it for something else. Okay, so that's why there aren't a lot of really old manuscripts of these biblical books because they're constantly being copied and it'd be sort of like if we had, you know, a songbook, right? And we looked at our songbooks and said, hey, the songbooks are getting pretty old. We need a fresh one, you know, and we copied it all over. And then you say, well, you'd keep the old one, right? And put it in a museum, right? No, what you do then is you'd, 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 you'd clean it and reuse it, recycle it. I mean, they were recycling back then, I'm telling you. And there's, all, there's a mountain of evidence that that's what they did all throughout the Middle Ages. They were constantly reusing pieces of parchment. So they would copy it fresh. They would copy it, make sure it's an exact copy, and then they would discard the original or wash it, reuse it, whatever, and move on with it. So how do you know when these things are written? You don't know because you're looking at a copy of a copy of a copy. So these expert scholars are saying, well, I think it was written, you know, 586 B.C. or thereabouts. I'm saying it was written back in the days of Joshua a thousand years before that. So who's right? How do we know who's right? We can't look to an old ancient document. And, and by the way, since then, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And then, you know, those are now the oldest 
manuscripts. But that doesn't mean that they're the most accurate. Yeah, right. Because the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were compiled and put together by a literal strange cult. And that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. Those, they can't be trusted. They're known to have tampered with and changed the Word of God. In, in those, there's evidence for that. But I'm not going to go into that. So the bottom line is that you have to look at the book itself. You have to look at the internal evidence to figure out when it was written. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm looking at the internal evidence where the Bible is saying it's written by Moses. It's saying that it's written by Joshua. But what these scholars are saying, well, somebody's lying there. You know, they want you to think it was written by Moses, so they lied. They want you to think it was written by Joshua, so they lied. It was really written a thousand years later. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So how do we know who's right? Well, they're looking at internal evidence and they, want, they have an agenda to want to say it was written later because they want to discredit it and say it's false. Right. But let me show you some internal evidence that proves when Joshua and Judges were written. And not only that, this goes to show you when the books of Moses were finished because it's all connected, okay? Look, if you would, at Joshua chapter 15. So I'm going to show you why these scholars are wrong, okay? Why what they're saying is false. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 15, verse 61, and, and you have to understand, Joshua 15 is a chapter about them dividing up the land, where the children of Israel are going to inherit the land, and they're giving different cities to different tribes to dwell in. And so right now we're going over what, you know, Judah inherits, and it explains they get these cities, they get these cities. But in the last verse of the chapter, it explains why they did not receive Jerusalem, even though they should have. Yeah, you know, verse 61, in the wilderness, Beth Arabah, Midian, and Sekica, and Nibshan, and the city of Salt, and Njidai, six cities with their villages. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. So the Bible is telling us here why they weren't able to inherit Jerusalem. Why? Because of the fact that the Jebusites inhabited Jerusalem and the Benjamites could not drive them out. Those of Judah could not drive them out. So it says the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Now, what does it mean unto this day? When this book was written, that was the status. Now look at Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1 verse 19. So in Joshua 15, 63 we saw, but now look at Judges chapter 1 verse 19. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. So one thing we know about when Joshua was written and when Judges was written is that when they were written, the Jebusites lived in Jerusalem and the children of Israel had not inherited those cities. Now, look, if you would, at 1 Chronicles chapter 11. Actually, you go to, I'm sorry, go to 2 Samuel 5. I'm going to read for you from 1 Chronicles 11, but I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. While you're turning there, I'm going to read for you 1 Chronicles 11:4. 4. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, past tense, the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come in hither. Why? They'd already beaten back the Judahites and they'd already beaten back the Benjamites before. And David says, I'm taking that city. And when he comes, the Jebusites say, you're not taking this city. And David said, whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went first up and was chief, and David dwelt in the castle. Therefore, they called it the city of David. It was called the city of David, Jerusalem, because it was not captured for the children of Israel until David came and captured it 
hundreds and hundreds of years later. Look at 2 Samuel 5, verse 6. And the king went, the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking, David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Millo and inward. So we see two very clear passages where David goes in and smites the Jebusites and he even smites the lame and the blind of the Jebusites, and he dwells in that city, and it becomes called the city of David. That's not the state that we see in Joshua and Judges. Both places are saying, well, they couldn't inherit it. That's why even to this day, the Jebusites live there. Now, do you actually expect me to believe that the authors of Joshua and Judges are just, oh, we're going to really trick people and make people think that this is a little bit older than it really is. So we're going to write down that the Jebusites are still running Jerusalem. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Obviously, it was written back then, and that was the situation. That's why they just kind of leave it at that. Yeah, now you understand why the Jebusites have a city in the middle of the inheritance that's supposed to belong to Benjamin and Judah. Why are they there? Because... They failed to drive them out. And see, if you understand Joshua, and if you understand the book of Judges chapters 1 and 2, you understand these chapters about the failure of the children of Israel to inherit the land. Why they failed to inherit this portion. Why they failed to inherit this portion. Jerusalem is just one of the places mentioned of, of, the, of the place that they couldn't inherit. Okay, So obviously, that is what they're saying is the status when the book is written. And so therefore, no, it's not written way later. Now, some people would say, well, you know, but it says Jerusalem. It wasn't called Jerusalem back then. It was called Jebus. False. It was called Jerusalem back then because even all the way back to the time of Melchizedek, Melchizedek was known as the king of Salem. Oh, and not only that, but the Jerusalem comes from the name of Jebus. Jerus, Jebus, it's almost identical there. And it's the same place name that had been with that place all along. What David called it was Zion. What David called it was the city of David. But it had always been Jerusalem or Jebus because the people who live there are Jebusites. And that's where Jerusalem even derives its name. And so if we look at the internal evidence, it's crystal clear that these books were written back then. So right there, that helps you to understand where did we get the first seven books of the Bible, right? Where did we get Genesis? Where did we get Deuteronomy? Where did we get Joshua and Judges? And then if we were to look at the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth is basically just an add-on to the book of Judges. It's just another story, and it just says, you know, in the time of the Judges, here's another story, because the book of Judges is you know, various stories from that time that were compiled and written down by holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Ruth is not a story about a judge. It's just a story that happened during that time. And so it's put as its own book right after Joshua, Joshua and Judges. Now you say, well, Pastor Anderson, you know, how dare you question these scholars? I mean, these guys are experts. They know what they're talking about. You know, how dare you look at the facts for yourself and point out the fact that it was clearly written before the time of David. How dare you point out that they are off by many hundreds of years and so forth? How do you know? Because these scholars don't understand the Bible as a result of being unsaved. Here, here's one of the things that just blows me away about the, these scholars, because I, I've listened to a lot of these, these scholars just to, to see their point of view on this stuff of, uh, you know, as they scoff at the, the, the validity of the Old Testament and the validity of the Bible. And one of the things that, they, that they'll point to, and this is just what blows me away, is that when they talk about in the Old Testament law, the concept of being clean and unclean, they don't understand it. Now, I'll bet you a little child in this room tonight understands the difference between clean and unclean. I mean, I bet if I were to call a little child up here and ask them, who wants to come up? Let's have a little child come up here. Who wants to come up here? A small child. Okay, Sophia, come on up here, Sophia. 
Okay. What do you, what do you think it means <laughs> for something to be clean? Right. Okay. So, how how old are you, Sophia? Eight. Okay. So she says, for something to be clean, it means it doesn't have stuff on it that's yucky, <laughs> right? Or, or like dirt on it. What else would you say about something that's clean? Like something that's like, like something that he will eat. The, like the stuff doesn't sound gross. Like it's not gross. Like yeah. Okay. Th these are. This is great. Okay. So what about something that's unclean? Something that's unclean. Something like dust or something that has dust. So what happens, let me ask you this. What if you, what if you got around stuff that was unclean and started touching it or putting it in your mouth? What do you think is going to happen to you if you start touching or, or licking something that's unclean? What do you think is going to happen to you? I would have to wash my hands. You'd have to wash your hands, right? right. And why would you have to wash your hands? What, what's going to happen if you don't wash your hands? then there's going to be a right. bunch of germs on you. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. Okay, and look, that was not staged. That was not pre-planned. I just, the first little child that I saw that put up their hand, this eight-year-old girl, in a few moments, I wasn't coaching her. I wasn't giving her the answer. I'm just asking her, hey, what does it mean to be clean and unclean? Is it really that hard? Were those questions really hard? Does your head hurt now as a result of having answered that? Okay. <laughs> Hey, I've, I've sat and listened to multiple of these Ivy League Old Testament scholars. I've sat and listened to multiple of them where they go on and on and on and they don't understand what a little child has just expounded to us. And in fact, the, the Talmud, this great encyclopedia of Jewish knowledge, 36 volumes, does not understand that which a small child has just expounded to us tonight. Why? Because professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Did you know that the world scholarship on the Old Testament, the world scholarship on the law, what the Talmud would teach is that, that the King James is wrong when it says clean and unclean. What it actually is is just ritual impurity. Ritual and pure. In fact, some modern Bible versions, instead of a leper walking around saying, unclean, unclean, they say, ritually impure, ritually impure. <laughs> Did you know that the Talmud says that the biblical plague of leprosy is clearly not contagious? Even though the Bible says they're supposed to cover their lip, meaning put something over their mouth. Like, how, how many of you have seen recently people wearing like a little mask over their mouth because they were trying to... Protect from germs. Okay. Well, you know, the Bible teaches that someone who had leprosy in the Bible days was supposed to wear something like that. And then they're supposed to also, you know, cry out and ring a bell and say, unclean, unclean. Why? So that people could stay away from that person. And so that the fluids of their spit and mucus would not come out of their mouth and infect someone. So therefore, you know, they're unclean. I've listened to these guys and they say, no, 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 it's, it, it, it's ritual impurity. Ritual impurity. All it has to do is just religious rituals. And I listened to this guy and he's explaining, he said, and this is like a guy with so many degrees behind his name, it just so many, he's just an expert, he's been to all the archaeological digs, and here's what he'll tell you. He said, you know, it's amazing when you look at the things that made you ritually impure. They weren't even sinful things. It had nothing to do with sin. It's just like, you know, you have a baby, you're ritually impure. Even though having a baby is a good thing. I mean, you're, you're following the command to be fruitful and multiply. And he said, you know, and then, you know, uh, women who where it's that time of the month, they're ritually impure. And, and, you know, it has nothing to do with sin. I mean, that's just normal. Or, you know, if you touch a dead body, you're ritually impure. And I mean, you know, burying dead bodies is a good thing. So it has nothing to do with sin. It's just ritual impurity. No, moron, it's dirty. It means unclean, yeah. idiot. Yeah. I mean, think about how stupid this is. Like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at the things that make you ritually impure, where you can't do these rituals and where you're spiritually, you know, I, I just, but it's got nothing to do with sin. I mean, look, it's dirty. It's unclean. It's yucky. It's that which is gross. Look, if you touch a dead body, you're dirty. You're unclean. 
I mean, isn't that pretty easy to understand? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're bleeding? That's unsanitary to bleed all over everybody. And, and hey, look, if somebody spits on you, if somebody bleeds on you, if there's oozing pus, I mean, the, I'm just talking about what the Bible talks about. Hey, that's unclean. And the chair that they sat on is unclean now. And the bed that they were sitting on is unclean now. And just as Sophia has expounded to us, he said, wash your hands with running water, bathe your flesh in water, be unclean. The Bible says, that if a man's seed goeth from him in the night, he washes up and, and it, you know, that made him unclean. So take a bath. I mean, is that really complicated, folks? Hey, if you touch a dead body, hey, if you butcher an animal, wash your hands, you're unclean. And then he says, look, if you're unclean, don't approach unto the Lord's sacrifices and the Lord's service and the Lord's tabernacle. Wash your hands first. Why? Because God didn't want his house being a dirty, smelly, unsanitary, germ-filled place. God is a God that loves decency and, and order. He says, let all things be done, even in the New Testament in God's house, decently and in order. God has always been a God that likes order and cleanliness and sanitation and organization. So it's not ritual impurity. I mean, what kind of stupidity is that? But they don't want to give God the glory for understanding germs thousands of years before they figured it out. Right. Because those idiots in these Ivy League schools didn't even know what germs were a few hundred years ago. And they were washing their hands in standing water when the Bible said to wash it in running water. What's the spiritual significance of that running water? What was the ritual purity that they're trying to achieve? They're getting their hands clean. Yeah. They're getting the yuck and the gross off their hands. Yeah. Hello, is anybody home? Yeah. But these... <laughs> <laughs> you know, once you get one child involved in the service, now every child really feels like they, they're part of the sermon. So they're, you know, that's great, kids. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're enjoying the sermon, kids. I'm glad that you're, that you're paying attention and you're following along. Look... <laughs> The bottom line is, they don't get it, friend. I, I, look, when I was eight years old, you know, it made sense to me too. It probably makes sense to a lot of eight-year-olds right now. About, yeah, if I touch a dead body, I better go wash my hands. Yeah, if I have blood or pus or spit or whatever on me, I need to go wash my hands. I need to get clean. Any body fluids, get cleaned up. Folks, touching a dead, I mean, look, it, this stuff isn't really that complicated. But the worldly scholars, they're blinded. They don't understand. And they have an agenda of just don't give God the glory. So we can't admit that these books were written a long time ago. And we dead sure can't admit that they understood germs and sanitation thousands of years before we did. So they just, oh, no, it's just a ritual for them. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just, no, it was actually them just being really clean and sanitary. Clean is the right word. The King James is right. Clean. Here's the opposite of clean, unclean. <laughs> I mean, that's why the Bible says, you know, if a woman gives birth, she's unclean because it talks about her continuing in the blood of her purifying. She's supposed to rest and relax and recover. And, you know, it's, she's not fully clean yet, you know. And, and I mean, that's a whole sermon. We could go through all the clean and unclean and, and so forth. That's all it is. It's that simple. And, and you say, well, why do you bring that up? I bring that up to point out the fact that the scholarship of this world is overrated. Yeah. Yeah. Some guy sitting in a university who scoffs at the Word of God, that's going to bias his interpretation. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, you'd have to be a complete idiot to read the Old Testament and say leprosy in the Bible is a, is a non-contagious disease. I mean, the, in the Talmud, the rabbis have literally said, we know that the leprosy of the Bible is not what we have today as leprosy. Because in the Bible, it's a non-contagious disease. But anyone who reads the Bible sees that it's contagious. You know, <laughs> cover your mouth, unclean, stay away from me. Okay, lepers are dwelling outside the camp and everything, you know, to be quarantined. But no, the Talmud says, no, no, it's not what we know today as leprosy because of the fact that, you know, we know that the Bible, and how do we know that? Because the Talmud says, Talmud says it's not contagious. It's just ritual impurity is what the Talmud says. You know, so basically the world's unbelieving scholarship accepts the Talmud as gospel and flushes common sense down the toilet.
That's what's going on today. And these are the same people that are going to tell you the dates that these books are written. Not because they have any hard, concrete evidence, because no one knows. There's no artifact we can point to of, hey, here's the earliest manuscript. No, there, there's very little to go on. You have to look at the internal evidence. And I'm not going to go through the whole Bible tonight because we're not going to have time. But, you know, so don't get scared or anything. You're like, oh, man, I'm extrapolating. We're seven books into the Bible. You spent this much time, you know. It's going to be a long night. Okay, but I'll finish it. I'll finish it next week. But, but the thing about it is that, you know, as we go through this and we see where the Bible came from, let me just stop right here and explain to you the importance of understanding that the reason that we believe that the Bible is God's word is because we look at the Bible and it's clearly God's word because it's right about everything. Yeah. I mean, how do I know that the Bible that I hold in my hand is the word of God? Is it because I saw Moses come down from the mount and I saw his face glowing and he handed me the book and said, here it is, Stephen Anderson? No, I believe it because I'm holding the book in my hand and I've read it and I love it and it's amazing, and there's nothing else in the world even close to being of the caliber of this book. Yeah, right. Nothing can hold a candle to it. And the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Where do we get our faith in the Bible? From an art? And you're saying, well, Pastor Anderson, you're, you're talking about where the Bible came from. Where do we get the Bible? I thought you were going to do an archaeology lesson. But see, that's not why we believe the Bible. We believe the Bible because of the Bible. Yeah. yeah. The Bible is awesome. The Bible is perfect. The Bible is always right. Therefore, it came from God. It's that simple. Okay. Now, when I show you where did we get the Bible, notice I'm using the Bible to show you where we got the Bible. See, I actually believe the Bible tonight. And if you didn't believe it, you probably wouldn't be here. You know, And 99% of people here, you know, I'm assuming, believe the Bible. So... We go through the Bible and we figure out where do we get the Bible. Now that we understand where we got Joshua, Judges, Ruth, now we understand where we got the first five books. Where'd they come from? Well, that's the first time we have a written word referred to in the Bible is these books. Okay. Then we get into books after Joshua, Judges, and Ruth known as the books of the Kings and the books of the Chronicles, right? First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Now, first of all, these books refer to each other. You know, when we're reading in the book of First and Second Kings, it'll say, hey, there's more written about this king. The rest of his acts, you know, are written in the book of Chronicles. And then we're reading Chronicles, they'll say, hey, it's written in the book of the kings of Judah and so forth. And they'll refer to other books that were written at that time, too. You know, the book of Nathan the prophet, the book of Jasher, the book of what, just all these books that aren't in the Bible. And you say, well, what are those other books that are being referred to? Basically, those are just other books. It's just that they're not God's word. Or if they were God's word, we have those words somewhere else in the Bible. Because a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament is redundant with one another. For example, a lot of that we know for a fact that a lot of the same stuff Jeremiah preached Zechariah preached some of those same things. Mm -hmm. So instead of God giving us both, where we just have redundancy, he only gives us the one and not the other. So we don't need the book of Iddo the prophet or the book of Nathan or the book of Jasher because these books that are written by Gad the prophet or whatever, you know, those are prophecies that we have somewhere else in Scripture. We have those same teachings somewhere else in the Bible. Okay. Or some of these books, like the book of Jasher, for example, may have been just a secular book at the time where he's just saying, yeah, it was also written in this other history book. Just because I make reference to a book, like, for example, I'm preaching the Bible right now. What if I made reference to a book and I just said something like, hey, you know, you could also read about this in, you know, this history book. I'm not saying that that book is written by God just because I refer to a book. And just because the Bible refers to a book isn't saying necessarily that, that book is written by God. So you say, well, who wrote 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles? We don't know who wrote those books. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And honestly, they were probably written by multiple authors because they span great periods of time. They span centuries each in their documentation. 
So it was probably an ongoing chronicle where they kept, they, they added to it as things happen and so forth. So you just have to have the faith to believe that this stuff's accurate, okay? And I'm going to get more into those books uh, next Sunday night because I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to do a disservice to the subject by just rushing through it. You know, I'm trying to, to, to slow down and teach this so that we can understand where we got the Bible. But ultimately, you have to believe the Bible. Yeah. Amen. And if you say, well, give me hard evidence. Well, you know what? If you want hard evidence, then you need to go to one of these uh, schools that we're talking about. Rutgers, Princeton, Harvard. Why don't you go to one of these universities and you can listen to one of these unbelieving, Christ-rejecting Jews tell you about ritual impurity for a while. And he'll, he's got all the evidence to show you. That's the, you know, yeah, the world's foolishness. If you want to go the unbelieving, skeptical route. But church is a place for people who actually believe the Bible. Right. So that's how we're approaching this subject. We're approaching it of, we believe the Bible, but we just want to learn about where it came from. It's interesting, right? I mean, hey, I want to know where Genesis, I want to know who wrote Joshua or who wrote Deuteronomy. You know, where did it come from? That's the purpose tonight. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for uh, your word, Lord, and for the, the, the things that you've taught us, Lord. And the, it truly is the greatest book in the world. It is, uh, it, it, you can't even really call it the greatest book because it's, it, it's in a category all of its own. Comparing it to other books is, is meaningless because it's, it's so far superior that it's not even on the same spectrum, Lord. I pray that every single person here tonight would read their Bible and do diligence and understand your word and study it on a daily basis, as the Bible says, to read therein all the days of our life, Lord, and help us all as we study and read your word to believe it, to understand it, to apply it to our lives. And Lord, we thank you for this amazing gift that you've given us in the, the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.